All right, welcome folks. You can see we've got uh, quite a few people joining us. So I hope you're here for rain gardens today. We'll get started in just a few minutes. We wanna give everybody a chance to log in. We have uh, disabled the chat for the webinar, so we will be using the Q&A. If you have a question as we go throughout the day today, feel free to uh, enter your question into the Q&A. I do want to let folks know as well that when the webinar concludes, uh, you will be prompted to complete a survey and that helps us um, as we plan future programs. So if you would, uh, when that survey pops up, if you could go ahead and answer those questions, it shouldn't take you more than two minutes. That would be great and really helpful for us. Again, you should be here for the Rain Gardens Florida Friendly Landscaping presentation today. We'll be getting started in just about two minutes. The chat has been disabled, but you are able to utilize the Q&A that's in your little control bar to answer questions throughout the presentation. All right, folks, well, I have uh, 1030, so we're going to go ahead and get started today. And I want to thank you for joining us. Um, you are here for Rain Gardens. Uh, my name is Alyssa Vinson, and I'm the residential horticulture agent at the Manatee County Extension Office. And I like to take just a minute at the beginning of our webinars to um, introduce what Extension is to the folks who may be new to joining us um, for presentations. We are um, a function of Florida's two land grant universities. So we work with the University of Florida. Um, we provide information to our communities that is locally relevant and applicable, that's based on the research that's conducted um, at the University of Florida, as well as FAMU, as well as other educational institutions throughout the country and throughout the world. Our mission ultimately is to enhance the quality of human life for folks in our communities. And so again, we do that by kind of connecting you with information and resources that is based on um, currently uh, applicable research. And at Extension, we really have a wide variety of programs. Um, you know, here today, you're going to be talking about rain gardens and water conservation in the home landscape with our Florida Friendly Landscaping Program Coordinator. But we also have programs related to livestock management and uh, small farm industry, as well as commercial fisheries and marine resources. We have a whole um, host of people that work specifically on family and nutrition programs and work with our schools in teaching nutrition education to, um, to our youth. And so I like to highlight some of the impacts that we have in Manatee County. Um, you can see, you know, millions of dollars in value uh, for new licenses and CEUs provided to pesticide license holders here in Manatee County, over $860,000 of value in volunteer time. And that's mainly through our Master Gardener Volunteer Program, uh, who those folks donate over 10,000 hours every year of their time just to providing uh, relevant and applicable horticultural information to our community. Um, and then we have over 28,000 youth that are educated through the 4-H Youth Development Program and 14 million gallons of water saved to Manatee County Utilities customers. And that's through a variety of both, you know, landscape conservation um, of water um, and other types of programs that we do. So 
I just want to thank you again for joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and stop my share now and allow Susan to share her presentation with you all. And I'm going to take this um, second to remind you of a few housekeeping items. We have disabled the chat function today, but please use the Q&A if you'd like to ask questions. And you will be prompted at the end of this webinar um, <clears throat> to take a survey and that's really helpful for us. It'll take less than two minutes and we'll um, be able to, you know, kind of change our decision making process for future programs based on that information. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and let Susan take it away. Right. Thank you, Alyssa. And welcome everyone. Um, my name is Susan Griffith and I am the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program Coordinator here at UF IFAS Manatee County Extension. So a lot of my work focuses on helping to prevent um, water pollution um, and focus on water conservation. So um, backyard rain gardens can definitely um, help with both. What exactly is a rain garden? You may want to know if you're not really familiar with the term. Um, rain gardens are designed to be sort of um, in a, an already uh, low area of your yard that may already collect some water um, or, or not. Um, you can also plan them for, for areas that are just near where your drainage comes off of your gutters. Um, that's an ideal area to, to plan a rain garden. Um, they are very attractive when they are done correctly. And they are basically landscaped areas using the appropriate plants to be able to utilize that water most effectively. And they really do help, um, plants in general help with the filtration uh, of a lot of, of the pollution that would otherwise be ending up in our aquifer um, or in other um, bodies of water nearby. Uh, in some cases, water that we may use for our municipal drinking water. So it's, it's a good way to um, have an extra filtration system, a natural filtration system. It's a good idea to try to use as many native plants as possible, but there are a few Florida friendly plants that also will work. Uh, one thing that you do not want to use are plants that are non-native that have a propensity to be invasive. Um, this is an ideal area where non-native, potentially invasive plants could really get out of control. So you want to avoid that at all costs. Um, you want to build it in a shape that allows water to percolate in, in a natural way. And they can be amazingly beneficial on many levels, um, also as a wildlife um, habitat as well. Here's an example of someone's yard, if you look at the picture below, that did not have a rain garden. And they put in this this lovely rain garden in the front yard so you can see it is definitely a visually attractive uh, addition to their landscape and they now have a lot less uh, grass to mow as well and to take care of in general. Rain gardens can definitely enhance the beauty of yards and communities, um, provide habitat for birds and butterflies, and help keep that water clean and to help alleviate some flooding problems. All of us who have survived yet another uh, dreadful <laughs> Florida summer, um, many of us have experienced uh, some ponding that can be pretty unpleasant. So rain gardens are a way to alleviate some of that. None of us want to have a, a swamp in our yard or uh, a mosquito breeding habitat. Uh, please do always remember before you make any changes to your landscape that you will need to get HOA permission if you do happen to live in an HOA or a condo association. You'll definitely need to have uh, their permission first. 
And before you ever do any digging in your yard at all, um, please remember to call 811 a week or so in advance, um, and they will kind of map out the utilities in your yard. A lot of people do have underground utilities buried uh, these days, so you definitely don't want to be the person that knocks out all of your cable for the whole community um, by digging into something underground. Um, and you certainly don't want to electrocute yourself either. So <laughs> um, there's no charge for the service. So highly, highly recommend you do that before you ever put a shovel to your ground. And once you start to dig, um, you'll want to determine the, the drainage of your soil. And so pick a few places and dig about a one foot deep hole and you'll do a preliminary test of that. Fill it with water and see how long it takes for that, that test hole to drain. And this is called a percolation test. You want to conduct your drainage test at least twice at each of the holes. And a typical quick draining rain garden is less than 12 hours. Um, typically, our sandy soils, really, you're going to be draining pretty quickly, um, a lot faster than 12 hours. Um, a standard rain garden can be as much as 72 hours, um, but anything greater than three days is considered more of a, a wetland, um, which can actually turn into a mosquito pit. So um, if it takes that long to drain, you are gonna need to do something probably besides a rain garden. Again, in Florida, that's very rare, however, um, for it to take that long to drain. Okay, so you'll want to investigate your soil further if it does drain very slowly. You want to take a handful of the damp soil from the bottom of the center of the hole and knead it in your fingers to see if it will form a ball. Um, if it does, if it feels really smooth and it forms a ball and you can kind of make a ribbon out of it, then that means you have mainly clay. Um, so dig down further to see if you can get past this 12 inches max. If you still have clay soil at 12 inches or below, this is probably not gonna be a good place for a rain garden. It's just never gonna drain as well as you would need it to. All right, pick a site for your garden that tends to collect water or where your runoff from your downspout can by, be diverted to it or already is diverted to it. And your rain garden should be at least 10 feet away from foundations, um, underground utilities and um, septic tank drain fields if you have a septic tank. Uh, also, I would say wooden structures as well. Uh, you don't want to put it um, closer than 10 feet to any sort of um, a wooden privacy fence or, or wooden deck or anything like that because it will definitely end up rotting it out. The average home is about 2,500 square feet and this can actually generate 1,600 gallons of water in one one-inch rain event. So a lot of water comes off of our roofs. You want to have a minimum slope of 1% down to the rain garden. This should not be a problem because really if you had less than a 1% slope in your yard, your house would probably flood regularly anyway. Um, so that should not be an issue. Um, you also want to um, possibly divert your water underground through pipes that are buried that are attached to your downspouts. That's another option um, shown here. You can kind of bury that guy and just have it feed right into your rain garden. And here's the anatomy of a rain garden. You have the water flowing off of your impervious surfaces, uh, such as a nearby driveway um, from your downspouts and into an area of, of specially selected plants that are appropriate for your rain garden, which we'll talk about in a little while. And the rain garden soil mix depth would be about 12 to 24 inches typically with a ponding depth of six to 12 inches typically. It can be a little bit less than that. 
So here's kind of what it looks like um, from the side. If it's dissected, we have our surface ponding depth here. We have a layer of mulch here. We have our planting soil layer here of the soil that we bring in and our total garden depth indicated here to give you a better idea of what's going on beneath the surface. So where to put your rain garden? As I mentioned, it should be at least 10 feet from the house so that the water would not have a chance of seeping into your foundation. Um, and you can see here where it's kind of bermed up. That's something that we'll talk about. Um, you do, it's important to have the berms on the edges um, to help kind of retain that water and keep it in place. If you do have a septic tank, you definitely don't want to put it directly on top of your septic drain field. You want to try to build the garden in full sun. Um, partial sun will also be, be good. Uh, you don't want to put it directly under a large tree. And digging will definitely be easier if you choose um, a level or gently sloped part of the yard. And here is an example of using rain barrels to help out with this process. If you do have rain barrels, you can certainly utilize them and actually hook up a garden hose to your rain barrels and have that come out and feed your rain garden when your rain garden might need additional water. You know how sometimes we'll have a long period of rain and then all of a sudden it gets really dry. We had, we've been experiencing that recently. Uh, so in a case like that, you may have really full rain barrels ready to go. Um, this would be an ideal use for that water. All right, determining the size of your rain garden, that's, that's an important thing to do. Um, you want to, as I said, figure out what kind of soil you have. Is it sandy? Is it silty? Is it clay? Um, how much roof area or, or sloped lawn will be draining into the garden? How deep do you think you want it to be? A, a typical rain garden is between four and eight inches deep, can go as, as deep as 12. Um, but just keep in mind that a rain garden deeper than eight inches may possibly pond water for a little too long and you definitely don't want to have a mosquito swamp. So you want to divide the, the total drainage area by 20 and that gives you a rough estimate of the garden's um, requirements. Um, you want to have for a shallower depth of more like three inches, you want to divide that total area then by 10 instead of 20. And how you calculate all that would be um, going by the size of your home. So if you have roof area that's 60 by 60, that's 3,600 square feet. And you'd estimate probably that a quarter of that surface area flows to the downspout that's going to be feeding your rain garden. So you take that 3600 and 25% of that is 900 feet. And in this case, um, in this calculation, the, the roof area plus the driveway um, is calculated in. So that brings it up to, an, uh, you know, bleh. <laughs> Add another 500, that brings it up to 1,400 square feet. And you divide that square footage by 20, and that comes up with 70 square feet. So your rain garden in this case should be at least 70 square feet. So a 5 by 14 or 7 by 10 um, would be sufficient. Here is an excellent rain garden manual that you can access online. You just need to Google, just put in these words, rain garden manual for Central Florida residents, and this will pop up. And you're able to scroll through it online and it has a lot of great information. That was actually produced by um, Hillsborough County Extension. All right. 
selecting your site um, and doing your design. So plants are a big part of, of the design, obviously. And you do want to try to use native plants as much as you possibly can. Um, but you can also select certain Florida friendly plants, um, flowers, ferns and grasses and shrubs, um, a small tree possibly uh, for the center. And you want to group plants together for the most impact and estimate one small plant per square foot. Florida has more than 20 native milkweeds and a lot of them are actually really good for really wet areas. Some of them are actually really good for really dry areas. So you want to do your research ahead of time. Um, sometimes it's made easier by the fact that the common name says swamp milkweed in this case with the one on the upper left. So you know that one's gonna be really good for the more center of your rain garden where it stays wet most of the time. Um, when you look at uh, the species tuberosa down here, this one is notoriously uh, fond of really, really dry soil. So that particular one would be much better served at the very outer edges of your rain garden if you're to use it here at all. Goldenrod is a native plant that flowers in the summer and fall. And it can take some wet feet for a while, but it's probably best to keep it in the outer edges of the rain garden um, because it, do it doesn't want to be completely saturated all of the time. Rain lilies, there are lots of different native varieties of, of rain lilies. There are also some non-native, so um, if you get them from a native plant nursery, you'll know that what you're buying is native, if that's important. And these guys are wonderful. They're little bulbs and they come to life every time that we have a good rain. Swamp sunflower is one that is good for the center of the rain garden because it definitely requires um, wetter conditions than a lot of other sunflowers. Hurricane lily is a non-native plant, um, but it would be a good addition to a rain garden. It's a bulb and it flowers during our heavy summer rains with these really beautiful flowers. And then there's also a yellow one as well. This is a native wildflower, our Florida tick seed, Coreopsis floridana. And this species can take much wetter soil than other Coreopsis species. So this would be another good one to plant more near the center of the rain garden. It is a short-lived perennial like most wildflowers, but it will reseed itself. And frog fruit is a nice little native trailing ground cover plant that is the larval host for three different butterflies, the white peacock, the common buckeye, and the fayon crescent. So this is a nice little ground cover addition. A lot of people think of this as a weed, um, but to me, it is a lovely little native ground cover. Blue flag iris, gorgeous, gorgeous flowers. It is native and it is definitely better suited to the more inner areas of the rain garden. It does need to have wet feet and it does flower in spring. Uh, brown savory, this one is actually one that Alyssa is a big fan of and I am now it now too. It is a native ground cover, excellent for moist sites, and it is a long-lived perennial. A button bush is a native large shrub that is really excellent for very wet sites, so it's probably best for a very large rain garden and because of its sprawling habit, and also needs to be in the more wet central area of the rain garden. Tropical sage is a wonderful native plant that can take periods of wet and long periods of dry. Uh, it doesn't really like the constant wet however, so this would be definitely better suited to the outer edges of your rain garden. And then our native canna, canna flaccida, 
is a native aquatic to semi-aquatic plant, so you definitely want to place him in the absolute wettest part of the rain garden. And they do bloom these lovely yellow blooms in summer. The cardinal flower, Lobelia cardinalis. It is a native wetlands plant, and it is another one that is definitely better suited to the center of the garden. And it's also best placed uh, near a plant that will shade it from the taller plants around it. It's not a big sun lover. A cinnamon fern is a large Florida native fern. It's quite beautiful. Uh, it does get up to five feet perhaps by four feet so it's definitely better in very large rain gardens for sure. The southern shield fern is another native fern that definitely stays much smaller, to more like two to three feet. It does spread very, very rapidly and easily though. So if you don't want to have a, a rain garden dominated by ferns, you may wanna not do this one or just be aware of the fact that you're going to be um, giving your friends lots of southern shield ferns possibly if you use this plant. <laughs> it is really beautiful though. The swamp twin flower. A lot of people don't realize that there are two different species of native twin flower. And this one, the Discharistia humistrata, is definitely the, uh, the wetlands version. So um, this one is better suited to rain gardens than the other one, um, Oblongifolia species, which actually really prefers dry conditions. So make sure that you're purchasing the right twin flower for your site conditions. Um, it is a great ground cover and it will spread and it will self-sow. Shrimp plant is a Florida friendly plant that doesn't mind wet, but it cannot take constant wet. So this plant would be better used on the outer edges of your rain garden and it does attract hummingbirds. So that is a good thing. And actually so does the, the cardinal plant we talked about earlier and the tropical sage. Uh, Carolina aster is a pretty delicate little flower, a nice little native, and it blooms in fall. Blue-eyed grass is a beautiful little flowering grass and it is um, great as a low growing mass ground cover for the outer areas of your rain garden. It can be winter dormant, so keep that in mind, but it does bloom with these really beautiful um, blue spring flowers. White top sedge is a wetlands plant nice native and it is going to need to be in your more wet central um, area of your rain garden and it will bloom in the spring and summer. Quite pretty. African iris is a non-native that can take dry conditions as well as some wet feet for some of the time. So um, it really doesn't prefer to be in, in a bog, so you probably would um, be better to use it on the outer edges of the rain garden. And it does have these lovely flowers when it blooms. Thakahatchee grass is a native Florida grass. And there's also a dwarf species called um, Tripsacum floridana. And that one only gets to be about four feet tall whereas the dactyloides gets up to six feet tall. So you may want to take that into consideration which species you'd want to use depending on the size of your garden. And Leavenworth's tick seed, Coreopsis leavenworthii, um, this one can go drier than the other one we talked about, so this is better for the outer edges of your rain garden. Again, like, like our, most of our Florida wildflowers, they will reseed copiously. 
Muley grass is another great native grass that can take extended periods of wet or dry. So it is an ideal plant to use for rain gardens. Purple coneflower, Echinacea purpurea, is a native perennial that flowers in spring and summer, or spring through summer. And it is good for the outer edges where it won't be sitting in wet all of the time. And yellow top, a native perennial that flowers for, for much of the year. That can definitely be an addition to your rain garden uh, and it can handle some wet feet. The native Liatris blazing star is a, a summer bloomer and you'd want to plant this one near the outer edges so it stays in the drier zones as it doesn't like to be in constant wetness. All right, you're going to want to lay out your plant plan first before you go plant shopping and decide where you're going to put all these guys and which ones are going to be the most ideal plants for you to use. Um, you're also going to want to plan out every, are you going to use rocks around your border? Um, are you going to want to put um, the taller plants near the center? Or are you going to want to put them near the back? So there's a lot of things to think about here with your placement. So it's definitely a great idea to map it out. Um, if you can't draw, don't worry about it. <laughs> a lot of people can't draw, um, but you can, you can basically come up with something that you can understand and that's all that really matters. Just get it on paper, plan it out, plot it out, and you'll have a much better um, idea of, of what to shop for and, and what you're, what you're going to be doing. Here are some examples. Um, there's a great variety of choices in shape, size, what have you, and obviously a great variety of plants can be used. We often recommend for people for planting any kind of garden that they lay out a rope or a garden hose first. Um, that works really well to try to get your, your shape, at least, of your, of your new garden or bed. Um, and you want to create the, the saucer contour with the, the berms on the outer edges um, and dig the depression down. You can introduce uh, additional sand, gravel, and peat, things that will help with um, your drainage. And you'll definitely want to create a swale to direct the water into the garden from either your, your downspout or your impervious surface. And a appropriate mixture of soil mediums for your rain garden would include 50% sand, 25% topsoil and 25% compost. Berms are very, very important. So here are some examples of um, how to create a berm, how to dig and how to create berms. Um, you can use a stake on the one side um, with a string across it to, to give you an idea and just dig down and then you'll be using that soil that you dig down to create your berm on the other side. And step four is get out your gloves and your tools, amend the soil to allow the rain garden to both evaporate and to slowly drain. Um, a rototiller possibly or larger equipment may be required depending on the, the size and scope of the project. And if it is a project for a church or a school or a town building, then you can definitely recruit some volunteers um, from some scouts or a school service project. Um, they're almost always willing to, to help out with things like that. And once your plants are in, you will want a good layer of mulch. Um, floor mulch can be used as a first layer and you can top it off with pine bark nuggets or just do floor mulch as your main mulch. 
and you will want to <clears throat> mulch around the plants first before you introduce any stones into it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, rain gardens that are surrounded by rocks and stones of different shapes and sizes really help to add a lot of visual interest and they can also help to reduce your erosion. Um, smaller stones and pea gravel can be used as a, a basin. Step five, maintaining your rain garden. Rain gardens are easy to maintain, but they are definitely not maintenance free. Nothing is maintenance free. <laughs> so during the first two or three years, uh, you'll want to water and replace the plants that did not survive um, and rearrange the plants to wetter or drier areas as needed. You may need to play around a little bit. Um, mulch at least annually to keep your soil moist and allow the easy infiltration of rainwater. Uh, two to three inches, and use a natural undyed mulch for your rain. We recommend as a, again, floor mulch or pine bark mulch would both be fine. You want to weed it frequently. Um, you want to periodically clear out dead vegetation and any debris that might end up in there. Um, but weeds, you definitely, you definitely want to be always on the look for weeds. There are some particularly egregious weeds. Um, this one is probably the, the worst enemy that you'll have with your rain garden is torpedo grass. It's an invasive weed and it's very common in a lot of our landscapes anyway. It, it, it likes moist soils, it likes water, so as soon as it hears that you're having a, a rain garden, put in your yard, it will be very excited to come visit you. You don't want that. So eradicate it as soon as you see it. This is what it looks when it's blooming. And it is not a welcome visitor. All right. So here are people that are playing their rain garden. And what is wrong with these pictures? I'm sure you all will have the answer right away. Look at how close that is to that wooden framed porch. Not a good idea. Not a good idea at all. So um, basically they butted it right against wood. <laughs> at best, it was only about a foot away from it. But then um, once they finished constructing it, the mulch just goes right up to that wood. So that is definitely not what you want to do. You want to be 10 feet away from any structures like that. And here's another one. This guy is not going to have that wooden fence for very long if he has a rain garden that butts right up against it. So <clears throat> you could have one in kind of close proximity to a, a fence as long as it was a little bit further out and you bermed around the edges of it so that the water was not just ponding right at the, the feet of the fence. That is not a good place to have a rain garden the way that they have designed this. So here are some before and after of <clears throat> Um, left, you can see in planning stages, they actually used uh, spray paint to mark out their edges here, and that is what it looks like completed. And over here, they started off with just uh, the basin here, and later on, all of the plants flourished, and they have a uh, a much more beautiful site now with all these native plants. Here's an example of where they have buried the pipe underground to, to drain into the rain garden underground. And here is a street side rain garden. Here is in the middle of a circular driveway nice rain garden, again with a, an underground buried pipe that is into rain garden. And here's another example. 
And here's one with a nice use of stone along the edge of the berm next to a sidewalk. Quite lovely. Here's another one. Um, a lot of people call us all the time during rainy season because their sidewalk is getting slimy and they're actually afraid that someone's going to slip and fall on their sidewalk and they don't want to just be out there pouring each mixture on their sidewalk all the time trying to reduce the algal, algal slime. So um, this is a good way to prevent that from happening by putting in a rain garden in an area before we get to the sidewalk to help to divert some of that water and have it percolate through the rain garden plants. Here's another example. And here's an attractive example with a lot of usage of stones of different types and boulders. There are a couple of other examples. <clears throat> so you can see pretty much sky's the limit. Here's um, one that is designed with plants um, that are native for the most part and also have the capacity to live in drier conditions. This is definitely a more native rain or natural looking rain garden. Here's another one with a lot of use of stone. And another one that sort of looks like a natural babbling brook. It's quite pretty. And here's one that belongs to one of our very own master gardeners, actually. They have this lovely rain garden next to their driveway. So, a final thought, don't stress too much over it. Rain garden does not have to be perfect to do its job. It will change over time, and that's one of the things that makes it so rewarding. It's a living dynamic system. So dig a hole, relax, and let nature take its course. Observe and have fun. And that is from Spencer Rowe, a wetland scientist. Um, good advice. Don't take it too seriously. And for more information, here are several different websites with great information. Um, the first one is Gardening Solutions, a UF IFAS website on rain gardens. And the second one is raingardennetwork.com. Third one is from the EPA about the benefits of rain gardens. And the Last one is Build Green um, at UFL with the facts about bioretention basins and rain events. And if you have any questions, if you need more information, I'm happy to help out with that. So please feel free to send me an email. I can be reached at sjgriffith at ufl.edu. And as always, we thank you for your time and for your efforts to conserve. Thank you, Susan. Absolutely. Everybody we, has a great day. We had, um, we had one question, um, actually two questions that came up and I was just gonna see if you mm -hmm. could um, address them real quick. There was a question about sure. your soil. If you have mostly clay soil, is there anything you can do to have a rain garden or is it just gonna be big kind of quagmire? <laughs> It could very well be a quagmire. Um, again, you're going to want to dig down, and if you have below 12 inches, you're still hitting lots of dense clay. Um, it's it's probably not an ideal spot for for a rain garden. So you could probably um, do a little bit of exploring through your yard and see if there's a nearby area that has a lesser concentration of clay. In some cases, I've seen it where um, certain areas of your yard might might be more full of, of clay area than others. So uh, there's still a possibility that you could play around with it and find a site that would be more appropriate. Mm -hmm. And um, somebody had a question about floral mulch. I answered them directly. I thought it might be good for the whole group to know um, what is floral mulch and why we recommend it. 
Oh, yes. Uh, floor mulch is probably the most sustainable of all mulches that are sold in Florida. It is actually made from the invasive melaleuca tree, which is a problem um, in particularly in the Everglades area of Florida, but it, it's it's really a problem throughout South Florida in general. Um, we even have some here um, that are problematic. So um, the floral mulch uses these invasive plants and grinds them up, composts it so that the seeds are not viable and it makes a wonderful mulch. It does not float away the way that other mulches do. And we definitely advise you against using cypress mulch, particularly um, because cypress mulch is obviously made out of native, very, very beneficial cypress trees. So it's not considered a sustainable mulch um, by any means. And you also want to be aware that a lot of mulches are made out of what they call mixed hardwoods. Well, you want to know what are those mixed hardwoods? Are those native oak trees that are dying for that or those a combination of native oak trees and native cypress trees and they get away calling it mixed hardwoods um, so you want to know you want to know what you're purchasing um, but floral mulch is an excellent product it has also got, undergone some testing with uf and has shown to um, kind of repel uh, termites as well whereas some mulches actually will attract termites. So um, that's another, another good reason to use floral mulch. Um, it is only available at Lowe's and Big Earth. Um, actually, I think Sweet Bay Native Plant Nursery also carries it. So yeah. um, only those three places in town have floral mulch. You can check with um, the Florida Association of Native Nurseries as well. If you're not located right here near Bradenton, many of the native plant nurseries do carry flora mulch. So um, check FANN.org and that can give you a list of um, local native nurseries. Um, and one last question about swamp hibiscus, scarlet hibiscus, just asking, mm -hmm. can you use it? And I think that the answer to that would be that the list that you provided is not all encompassing and there are many other plants that would be good, um, but feel free to go ahead and answer. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> that is correct. Um, it, it, it would definitely be one of those that, that needs your wetter areas of the rain garden, um, but absolutely yes. I couldn't put every single plant obviously here or we would have been here all day long. <laughs> but, um, but yes, you can definitely use swamp hibiscus. Great. All right. Well, seeing no other questions, we're going to go ahead and end the webinar for today. We really appreciate your time and please feel free to reach out to us. Um, again, remember that you'll be uh, prompted to take a survey at the completion of the webinar. Um, and also, since you registered for the webinar, you will have access to the recording if you want to go back and review the information. All right. Thank you all and have a wonderful day. Thank you.